In the program for these forum sessions, you have some biographical information on Lord Ashdown. Uh, and I more or less took this from what his office sent us, but I was interested that what they sent us stopped at the point at which he took up his responsibilities as high representative. So I thought that rather than repeating what you can all read, I would pick up the story a little bit, and I must give some credit to the New York Times and Newsweek and The Guardian, who have all published articles on Lord Patty Ashdown in the last two weeks. Uh, and of course, the internet is always our help and guide uh, when we're searching for information. But for the last three and a half years, uh, Lord Paddy Ashdown has been in a post that some have likened to that of a colonial governor, an imperial viceroy, or even a medieval pope. <laughs> I didn't ask his opinion about that at lunch. I don't know which one of the three he prefers. But his powers include the ability to impose laws and to fire public officials, and he of the now five uh, high representatives in Bosnia-Herzegovina, has used those powers more extensively than his four predecessors to create uh, centralized customs, defense, and intelligence structures, and most recently to bring parties to agreement to consolidate the 13 separate police forces uh, into a single police uh, structure within the country. He also has uh, fired 59 Serb politicians, police officers, and public officials, accused of blocking the hand down, uh, handover excuse me, of war crime suspects to the International Criminal Tribunal in The Hague. These actions, not surprisingly, have been controversial, uh, and uh, he has been criticized from some quarters for doing too much, for weakening Bosnia's fledgling institutions, uh, many would say that he is the last high representative who will wield such extraordinary authority, that one or more who may come after him, uh, and he did announce uh, that he will be stepping down in a few weeks, uh, at, but that he may be the last to wield the extraordinary powers uh, that the Bonn Conference uh, gave him, or gave the high representative uh, some years ago. Lord Ashdown has been quoted as saying that he now regards Bosnia-Herzegovina as his home. He has bought a house there, and uh, five of my students and I uh, passed by the lovely lakeside between Sarajevo and Mostar last May, uh, and we're told that that's where Lord Ashdown has purchased a home. Beautiful location, I must say, uh, and that's terrific. Uh, but it is our pleasure, Lord Ashdown, to welcome you to Dayton, the city associated with the agreement that ended the war in Bosnia-Herzegovina, and the peace that you have been charged with making a long-term reality for Bosnia and Herzegovina by fostering the building of conditions for the rule of law, justice, reconciliation, and the functioning of a political system and an economy. I am delighted to welcome you here to Dayton. We are thrilled that you agreed to participate in these events. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Lord Patty Ashdown. Well, what, a, what an introduction. I mean, I feel as though I shouldn't come up here. I should swing through on the rope or something. <laughs> when, I was, um, when I was first elected to the, um, the British House of Parliament, um, my election came as something of a surprise to my rather older, dyed-in-the-wool conservative opponent, who slightly grumpily came up to me afterwards. I was younger then and said, my boy, my boy, I give you one piece of advice. And I thought something wonderful was about to appear. And he said, never stand long between an audience and its meal. <laughs> it's good advice, and so I thank you very much indeed, Margaret, for, um, for uh, allowing me the very civilized uh, pattern of speaking afterwards. The French do it because they value their meals so highly. Uh, but let me tell you, if you have a speaker, it, he will value it highly too. Well, I must confess that having heard about the discussions you've been having in the last uh, 24 hours, um, speaking before you today causes me a little trepidation. Um, I, I'm feeling a bit like Zsa Zsa Gabor's fourth husband, who, <laughs> who when, he was, uh, when he was asked on the day of their marriage how he was uh, 
regarding being married to this iconic woman said, um, well, I know what I have to do, but I rather doubt I can make it interesting, he said. Um, which is uh, a bit how I feel at the moment. So let me give you a, make a confession to you first. As I, uh, since I took up my duties as the International Community's High Representative for Bosnia and Herzegovina, title that seems to me is extracted from Gilbert and Sullivan, um, some three and a half years ago, I've often remarked publicly that the days when the future of BIH could be discussed and decided at, quotes, an Air Force base in Ohio have long since passed. I retract that completely. <laughs> in this audience, how could I do otherwise? Um, that was clearly intended to be a metaphorical rather than a literal statement. But I can't tell you how much pleasure it is, Margaret, for me to be with you here in this city, whose name has become so much the currency of our everyday parlance in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, you know, I think the, the work that was done here in Dayton 10 years ago uh, can be judged very simply by its results. It was work of lasting moral and practical political value. The talks ended three and a half years of carnage, as of course we all know. But nevertheless, I think even the fiercest critics of Dayton and the process that it launched could not deny and do not deny that it saved lives and ended one of the most terrible wars of the second half of the 20th century. This alone, if that was its only achievement, would be a signal achievement. It's important here, I think, that we make a clear distinction between the settlement itself and the settlement process that followed afterwards. The settlement was negotiated here, of course, in a period of weeks. But the process, the Dayton process, has continued ever since. The negotiations, in a sense, have never stopped. And it is that Dayton process which has sustained BIH on its long, difficult, but ultimately successful journey of recovery. And to understand just how far the country has come, it's only necessary, I think, to note that only 10 years after that terrible war, BIH is now about to enter the process which eventually will lead to full European Union membership, something which would have been, quite frankly, inconceivable three years ago, let alone ten. This is the same country whose negotiators ten years ago, let's remember, retained as part of their strategy the option of returning to war. It is the same country whose citizens a decade ago had been consigned to live in deprivation and fear, and did for some time afterwards. And yet here it is now, a mere 10 years later, poised to enter the European Union process. Now all of us, I think, acknowledge that BAH has come very much further, very much faster than most people could have possibly hoped for when the agreement was signed not far from here a decade ago. And when I think of the chief reasons for this is because the Dayton Agreement is not some dead letter which could never be changed. It is, on the contrary, a living agreement containing, on the one hand, a judicious mix of enough firmness to maintain peace, and it has, <coughs> with enough flexibility to enable reform. What then have we learned from the Dayton process in Bosnia and Herzegovina? Well, I'd say that a key lesson has been that political settlements are not and cannot be simply written in stone. They won't last like that. Interpretation, implementation, modification must be part of making that kind of living agreement work. And they have made Dayton work. First phase of implementation was characterized by impressive military compli compliance and, you might agree with me, scandalous political evasion the interpositioning of NATO-led troops along the front lines in the space of just three weeks in the winter of 1995 was a remarkable example of resolute and effective military deployment. <coughs> Since the first days of that deployment, peace and security in Bosnia and Herzegovina has never been challenged. Let me remind you of this astonishing fact that not, uh, not once in those ten years has a single foreign uh, person working in Bosnia and Herzegovina for the international community, whether soldier or civil servant, been killed in the process by any kind of hostile action. 
the successive reductions that have then since occurred in the peacekeeping forces themselves reflect that steady process of consolidation. The continuously diminishing, still diminishing, strong European Union force, which took over from the remarkably successful NATO forces that pre preceded it, that force has the capability still today at a much lower level of troops to maintain a safe and secure uh, environment in a country where the armed forces themselves, domestic armed forces, have been massively downsized and brought under the democratic control of the state in these last few months. However, the early phase of the political implementation, as we all know, was considerably less satisfactory. In the months after Dayton, wartime racketeers consolidated their stranglehold on local administration. Those who had done well out of the black market during the war set themselves up as suppliers of goods at inflated prices, and many of them, frankly, migrated into the political stratus too, in a general environment of acute scarcity. In this phase, political implementation was characterized by reluctance, incapacity, and obstruction. And so it took time for the international community to address that problem. The initial focus was on holding free and fair elections. Perhaps you might consider holding them a little too early, but we'll leave that to one side. Three general elections were conducted in the first seven years. It's not, I think, inaccurate to conclude that each successive poll was freer and fairer than the one before, but these polls took place in an environment that was already distorted by political, social, demographic, and economic anomalies. As the political parties poured energy into delivering makeshift, makeshift assistance to their constituents, typically quite frequently by diverting international aid from its intended purposes, and vying for the spoils of office, the real political situation was one for too many years of stasis and decay. And perhaps for too many years, we in the international community did not enforce the Dayton procedures in ways that we should. Perhaps this was obscured in the early, in the early stages by the volume of aid pouring into the country in those early years. But by the late 1990s, it had become increasingly clear that that problem had to be tackled. So the second phase of the Dayton process saw the introduction of the Bonn powers to which Margaret has referred at the end of 1997, enabling the High Representative to cut through the thickets of obstruction by removing recalcitrant officials and where necessary enacting reforming legislation. And just in case you think that High Representatives like me act as like some mad poltergeist throwing the furniture about whenever we do this, we consider how we use those very, very carefully. And I never used the bond powers, and neither did my predecessors, except when we believed it was the only option necessary. And by doing so, we admitted a failure, a failure both of BIH institutions and of the international community to persuade people to make progress by other means. Now, together with this new bond powers, there was a new focus on making the political and economic institutions work, as opposed to propping them up with international largesse. Deep and lasting foundations for reform had to be laid, and this meant modifying some of the key core provisions of Dayton's. So reforms agreed by the principal parties, in the first case under my highly distinguished predecessor Wolfgang Petrich in April 2002, designed as they were to facilitate the implementation of the Constitutional Court's reading, rulings on constituency people. That actually inaugurated the process of difficult but necessary overhaul of the Dayton process as it was first established, if you like, changing Dayton within Dayton. Difficult, of course, because it involved reopening issues that had proved themselves excessively, exceptionally sensitive uh, at the Dayton negotiations. Necessary, however, because this was the only way of addressing the fundamental injustices in the fabric of BIH's political structure and the only way of preparing the country for the European Union accession process. BIH, as it stood at the start of this decade, was still, however, a long way from meeting modern European norms in regard to political representation, civil rights, ease of access to legal redress, and basic administrative efficiency. 
The model through which we have sought to deliver effective for reforms within the context of BIH's particular social and political requirements has been to create the basic institutions of a light-level state governing a highly decentralized country. And it was to that that I set my hand three and a half years ago. Could we take the Dayton Agreement, use it to create those broad outline structures of a modern light-level state governing a decentralized country? And let me into, let you into a secret. Before I did my, uh, started my mandate, I went to see one of the authors of Dayton, Jim O'Brien, who said to me, why is it that the international community allow the obstructionists to use Dayton to obstruct, whereas we who wrote Dayton put into it certain instruments which, if used, would allow the process of reform to continue. And that is what we did. And we did it, some would say, rather fast, some would say too fast. Nevertheless, what was concerning me when I took up this job three and a half years ago was to use the Dayton process to make those reforms necessary to get the country through the gates onto the European road before those gates began, as indeed they have now begun, I regret to say, to close. Now this is a model which has evolved through the Dayton process. It is a logical corollary of Dayton and it deals with key issues that could not be dealt with in a satisfactory way at the time when Dayton was first written. And I pay tribute to the wisdom of those who wrote it in placing those instruments within Dayton that allowed it to reform within the Dayton process. In constructing this model, we have sought to take BAH to a destination that, let me remind you, by a huge margin, the majority of its citizens want to reach to move irreversibly on course to effective statehood and onto the path that leads to the Brussels institutions of the Euro-Atlantic Alliance, the European Union on the one hand, NATO on the other. I'm happy to say to you that as of this autumn, we are now firmly on that road. No one inside or outside BIH now wants to go back to the difficult and tortuous path that has brought us to this point, and that itself is an achievement. It's been a long struggle and a hard struggle. And the people of BAH have had to put up with great hardship, and often they've had to put up with hardship that frankly could have been avoided if some of their political leaders had shown greater imagination, greater wisdom, and put the interests of the citizen first. But I have to say to you that latterly, the political establishment of BAH, for all its faults, and I'm a politician, so all politicians have failures and all political systems have them too, and of course BAH is no exception, but for all of those, the political establishment of today has mustered, let us admit it, the necessary courage and creativity to overcome those remaining obstacles. Now, I pay tribute to them for this. I seem one way or another to have spent a good deal of my life fighting destructive nationalism, and I'm not about to change now. Nevertheless, I have to concede that the self-styled nationalist parties who won the BIH elections in October 2002 have nevertheless managed, with a little help from their friends, to preside over the strongest period of change and reform in BIH's post-Dayton history. And some, at least, and I welcome this, appear now to want to internally reform themselves away from the old-style nationalism of the war years and towards the more conventional center-right European politics, what I call sanitarization. I welcome this process and I hope it continues. The question now for the political nomenclature of BIH is not can they do the reforms, they've completed those. The question is can they implement them? And that is the crucial question for the next phase. So Margaret, ladies and gentlemen, today I think we have a rather remarkable view. We can look back towards Dayton, but we can also look forward towards Brussels and the Euro-Atlantic institutions that are Bosnia and Herzegovina's natural, ultimate destination. It is the European Union and BIH's eventual accession to it that must now exercise the preponderant influence on Bosnia and Herzegovina's further progress. The Peace Implementation Council has made it clear that once the SAA process is underway, it, we, are prepared to begin to phase out the bond powers, and I greatly welcome that. Indeed, I have been recommending it for some time. Bond powers were instituted for a purpose. I believe they've largely served that purpose and are therefore less necessary day by day. At the same time, 
The Peace Implementation Council has indicated that the inauguration of the SAA process will create appropriate circumstances in which to transition, transition the position of High Representative into that of European Union Special Representative. This transition can, I believe, begin shortly and could be completed, uh, barring unforeseen circumstances, by the next general election of October 2006. The evolution and subsequent phasing out of the Office of the High Representative, which is, I think, Dayton's greatest signal achievement, could then be viewed as a useful administrative and diplomatic process, uh, diplomatic footnote to the Dayton process. Now, all of us are aware of the reliable capacity of organizations to perpetuate themselves. Provisional bureaucracies have a habit of grafting onto the body politics as permanent fixtures. Temporary positions have a habit of becoming permanent. This has not, I think, happened in the OHR, where we have aggressively followed a, po a policy of downsizing the OHR as each of our missions are completed. OHR staff today is less than half of what it was when I took it over three and a half years ago, and the budget at 13 million is less than half of the 26 million budget that was in existence in 2004. And we are actively and daily looking at ways in which OHR can transfer many of the functions that have fallen to us in the course of the last decade to the people who ought to have it, the proper democratically elected authorities of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now, paper objectives, of course, can be met on paper. In judging the success of the Dayton process, are we adrift from the day-to-day -day experience of the people of BAH. Well, Bosnia and Herzegovina is not perfect, and I'm the last person to pretend that there is not still a huge, a huge amount of work to be done. Poverty remains a terrible scourge in Bosnia and Herzegovina. The economic improvements have not yet touched the lives of ordinary people by improving them. Unemployment is unacceptably high. Far, far too many of the gifted young of Bosnia and Herzegovina still choose immigration, emigration. No state can tolerate this massive hemorrhage of its young and its talented for long. So there is a huge amount yet to be done as we start to now move BIH from the phase of Dayton into the next phase. But, but the economy is growing this year faster than any other economy in the Balkans, albeit from a very low base. Jobs are being created, though not nearly fast enough, to give people the prospect of reasonable chances of employment. And there is an increase both in foreign direct investment and indeed in our own experts, exports and in manufacturing, although again from a des desperately low, low base. Public services are very, very slowly improving, but improving nevertheless. And I think they will continue to improve as increased revenue derived from a significantly more efficient fiscal system comes on stream, particularly after the 1st of January this year, with next year with the introduction of VAT. Now, these improvements did not happen by accident. They are the results of those reforms that have brought BIH closer to Europe, and in the coming year, the pace of reform has to quicken, and the delivery of benefits to the citizen must quicken too. We may have done things at the high level of politics in BIH, but that has not yet seeped through to an understanding amongst ordinary people's lives that their, li that their li living conditions are improving or will improve in the near future. So BIH is already is still improving, but it needs to improve at a faster pace. I visited BIH in 1992 for the first time. Then it was sliding into a cataclysm that brought tragedy to its people and shame to the international community. I visited the country regularly during the war and the last three and a half years as its high representative charged with implementing Dayton have been amongst the most rewarding of my professional life. So I recognize though things have got better in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we still have a long way to go and they haven't got better fast enough. And I'm the first to recognize that. So the job of my successor, I believe, is now to concentrate on making the country function better. Functionality, it's not a very nice or elegant word, but it is the key word for the next phase of Bosnia's development uh, as it moves forward to full sovereign statehood. Now this means primarily, it seems to me, 
two things. Making the state institutions we have created in the last three and a half years work and function effectively and helping BIH itself to function better, much better. You know, no state can prosper which spends in some of the areas, I'm thinking of the Federation, 70% of its hard-pressed citizens' taxes on government and only 30% on its citizens' services. So BIH must now cut the cost of government, which impoverishes the citizens and stifles the economy. Constitutional change, now much talked about in BIH, is not an end in itself. It's not an intellectual exercise. It means making the state function in the interests of its citizens. It means creating a state which puts service to its citizens before salaries to its politicians. This task, the task of making BIH work better, is, I believe, not an event that's going to happen one day. It's a process. And I am very glad, and I'm bound to say proud to say, that that process, thanks to the work of Don Hayes, Bruce Hitchner, and others, has in recent weeks now begun. I welcome that. It was something Don and I talked about two and a half years ago. And it is now delivering, I think, an opportunity for BIH to move into its next phase. Now, let's admit it. Progress so far has been modest and is likely to remain modest this side of the next election. But nevertheless, it started. It started by consensus. And provided there is a commitment for that to continue, then that process of reform to the Constitution, increasing the functionality of the state, should carry Bosnia on the rest of its journey to full sovereign statehood and a member of the European Union. It seems to me now essential to keep that process going, even if we might recognize privately that the major achievements will not occur until after the October 2006 election. So let me conclude. I said when I arrived in Bosnia and Herzegovina three and a half years ago, the beginning of my mandate, that Dayton had to be our foundation, but it could not be our ceiling in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And like any foundation, it's what you build on it that matters. But I commend and applaud Dayton for, what, for delivering not just peace to a country so racked by war, but also to delivering for the world, arguably the world's first successful post-Second World War peace stabilization mission. And my goodness me, our world needs such successes. Dayton has indeed proved our foundation. It cannot be our ceiling. So it has proved, and so it must continue to prove. The agreement whose 10th anniversary we celebrate today has, I believe, given this remarkable, beautiful little country and its brave and courageous peace, people peace after the terrible ravages of war. But it has also enabled something more. It's enabled the start of a reform process that will finally complete the journey begun 10 years ago by putting Bosnia and Herzegovina firmly as a modern, sovereign, democratic state where it should be in the membership of the family of the states of the European Union. And when that does occur, however many years ahead it might be, I am very confident that this little country will become one of Europe's little jewels. Thank you very much. Lord Ashdown has agreed to take some questions from the floor. I'm going to exercise the prerogatives of the chair for the moment. Uh, you actually wear two hats. Yep. You're not just the high representative, you're the European Union's representative in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And shortly after I left Sarajevo in mid-May, there were <laughs> the referenda in France and the Netherlands. Yeah. And my students and I had had conversations with Jakob Finci and many others in Sarajevo in which they referred to the hope that they put in the European Union and becoming part of the European Union. And I found myself saying when I returned here to Dayton and saw the results of those referenda and read the accounts of the sentiments uh, in France and the Netherlands especially, but elsewhere in Europe as well, particularly this summer as the discussions about Turkey's accession uh, came forward, 
that I wondered if that hope was going to be in vain, yeah, that, the, that what's happening within the EU itself mm. was going to mean that this was going to be difficult. Because I know that when the Poles became part of the EU, everybody cited 80,000 laws and regulations of the EU with which Poland and the Czech Republic and Hungary and so on would have to bring themselves into conformity. That number's got to be easily 90,000 by now, given the way the EU works. So there's my question for you. <laughs> Deadly question, Margaret. Um, That's what professors true. are for. I know. It's two I have two hats. I have to tell you that if Gilbert and Sullivan were alive today, I'm sure he would write an opera about the office of the high representative. Uh, I am high representative. You could have a variation on the modern major general, You could, right? indeed, yes. yeah. It said that Queen Victoria on, on, on rainy winter days used to sit in Osborne Castle and design um, uniforms for, uh, for, for British, British Army regiments, which they, poor unfortunate creatures, then had to wear in the wilds of Afghanistan. <laughs> I, I've actually thought that on sort of rainy days I might design myself two uniforms, you know, one with a big half a chicken on the top <laughs> uh, and the other with some splendid gold braid around the hat so people knew what I was when I was operating in each of my roles. Um, the, um, look, I, I want to speak not just about, it's a very, very serious question, I want to speak not just about Bosnia and Herzegovina. I want to speak about that region which we call the Western Balkans. And here's the truth, there is only one glue that holds this region together, and it's the prospect of joining Europe. And if that glue is taken away, then I, I fear that the battle to create stability where instability was uh, will go into reverse and there will be a huge destabilizing effect. That's true of Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's true of Serbia Montenegro, it's true of the entire Western Balkans and Europe will suffer. We saw twice in the last century the extent to which instability in the Balkans can wreak terrible havoc in Europe as a whole. But it isn't, you don't have to go to history to know how Europe will suffer if that happens. 90%, 70% of the traffic women in Europe cities now come through the Balkan corridor. A great amount of the trafficked uh, drugs and crime, criminality today, they don't come from the Balkans, but they come through um, this less than totally lawful space which is currently existing in the Balkans. So bringing the Balkans into the European Union is an absolutely crucial task, not just for the West Balkans, but for Europe itself. And Margaret, you are right. When those two referendums were held, a shockwave ran through the Balkans. Is the door closing? Are they going to turn their back on us? Uh, is this a destination from which we are now going to be locked out? Uh, and that's one of the things that's driven me um, these last three and a half years. I could feel, I'm a politician, hairs on the back of my wrist told me that Europe's <coughs> public was changing its view, that the wide open door to the east was not necessarily going to be wide open for too much longer. And I regret that. I think it's a sign of lack of European leadership that that has occurred, but it has occurred and is occurring. Now, I think there's a good aspect to this, perhaps, which is that I think there is a general realization in the chancelleries of Europe, if not necessarily amongst the voting public of Europe, that the West Balkans are different from the other big question we must address, which is Turkey and the Ukraine. In many ways, if you leave the West Balkans out, then this is not a black hole the other side of Europe's borders. It's a black hole within Europe itself. And I will argue and will continue to argue that getting the West Balkans into the European Union is unfinished business within Europe's present borders. It's not a pro about, about enlargement beyond that. Um, but I have to say to you that that argument is going to be more and more difficult to win <coughs> as we go down the track of the next few years. I get worried as a passionate European by the way, a passionate European Atlanticist, and I don't see anything contradictory between the two, uh, that Europe is turning in on itself, and this worries me a very great deal. So my strong advice to my European friends is do this and do it fast. My strong advice to my Balkan friends is don't delay. Make haste down this road. And by the way, if you can present yourself to Europe um, when you do, not as beggars at the gate, not asking to be let in as an act of charity, but that you are wishing to come into Europe because you will add value to the European Union. And I think they will. I mean, in a world which is trying to establish relations with the world of Islam, the West Balkans has got something special to offer. It's got something special to offer in terms of its cultural diversity, its richness. 
and that's the basis upon which this appeal should be made. So I do, frankly, look at both the developments in Europe and their knock-on consequences in, in the West Balkans region with some concern, which is why we cannot afford to waste time. We have to travel down this track as fast as possible. Thank you. Having exercised my prerogative, the floor is now open for others' questions. <coughs> Yes, if you would stand, please. Yeah, you mentioned uh, that there's been almost no violence with respect to the peacekeepers in the area, but there seems to also have been almost no violence between these ethnic groups who supposedly have these ancient peacekeepers and so forth. Do you have an explanation for that? <laughs> I, I am constantly stunned and amazed by it. Um, uh, and I... It, I remember during the war when I was arguing in the British Parliament for intervention, and I came back, and I hope I'm not, I know perhaps I am betraying competences, but I can do so here. I came back um, and had a word with the then British Foreign Secretary, Douglas Hurd, and Douglas said to me, oh, look, they've always fought in the West Balkans. You know, that's their nature. Um, what we ought to do is build a fire break around it, let it burn itself out. A disgraceful comment, incidentally, for which I think Douglas has much regretted since. Um, I said to him, Douglas, how can you say that? If ever there is any collection of nations that have always fought each other, and the cost in blood and terror incalculably greater than the Balkans, it's the nations of the European Union. If Europe offered us a way out of the terrors of repeating war, why should you deny it to them? So I reject that argument, as I think it is now otherwise broadly rejected. But here's what stuns me. Look, I'm an Irishman. Um, I marched into my own home city of Belfast as a young soldier in, in uh, 19, 1969 to watch my own people, the Catholics, being burnt out of their homes. None have come back. A million. A million have gone back to the homes from which they were burnt and brutalized. If you go to Durva today, the Serbs are back and they're in a majority, driven out almost to the last man and woman by Operation Storm. If you go back to the Golgotha of Srebrenica, the Muslims are back. All the villagers are women. There are no men there because the men have all been killed, but they're back living with their Serb neighbors. Now, I know I couldn't do that. I know I haven't the courage to do that. I often go with my wife and spend the night living with refugees, and I do so as an act of homage to the absolute raw bravery of people who have the courage to move back. I think if there, is a, if there are heroes about this extraordinary thing that's happened in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the heroes are the ordinary, tough, resilient people of Bosnia and Herzegovina, of all ethnicities, who've simply decided to take up their lives and, uh, where they left off and live them again. Uh, it is a matter of constant surprise to me. One final little story. My wife and I went to stay with a, a, an old man of 78 called Ahmed Sitkic. He lived uh, uh, on the mountains above uh, Visegrad and was living at the time in an old UNHCR tent, two years old, um, by his house, waiting patiently for somebody to come and provide the money to rebuild his house. Uh, he was there with his wife. We spent the night with him in the tent. The tent was so rotten that when it hailed, the hailstones came straight through the tent. And here he was, uh, clearing his ground, rebuilding his farm, patiently waiting to, um, to, to, uh, to, to rebuild his life at 78. That's remarkable enough. But the really remarkable thing was it's the third time in his life he'd done it. The third time. The first was, um, was the, uh, was, uh, were, were the Germans. Uh, the second were the partisans. And then there was Arkan. And Arkan did, killed everything, the worst of the lot. Men, women, child, dogs, cats, the lot. But there he was back again. Now, I don't know how you have the courage to do that. I know in my life I couldn't. So I agree with you, this extraordinary miracle uh, that although politicians are still, in many ways, locked into the psychology of the war and are fighting their war at the political level, in so many cases, uh, ordinary people are simply living together. Is there love between them? No, of course not. Uh, it hasn't even yet come to, in many cases, cooperation, but there is cohabitation, and that's the beginning, and it is a miracle that it's happened. It's a miracle. Do we have other questions? Great. A short presentation. Hmm. We're
we're delighted you're here. We're sorry that you missed the gala dinner last evening uh, and our wonderful guests there, but we have saved one of the bells, oh, crafted wow. by a local artisan and cast in a local foundry that you may take back as a symbol of being here in Dayton, the city of peace. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. That's really fun. Thank you.